working in open source uh, means you need to be quite humble uh, and you need to be oh to be quite open to criticism you know to hearing people saying that's bullshit and a lot of people have uh, for instance criticized the transformers library and rightfully and i still think it's definitely a library that by some aspect is uh, maybe very bad in terms of design but that's the design we choose and that's the one that uh, allowed to have more like a 200 architecture inside of it uh, but you have libraries that are much differently structured and so you need to be able yeah. to hear people saying this is very badly designed and to say yeah that's that's true but somehow uh, we decided to do that because we need to to do that and that and so you need to be quite humble and that's uh, that's something that's um that's uh, yeah that not always everyone can 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 have or are happy to are happy to do Hi friends and welcome to a very exciting episode of Leading with Data. Today I have with me Thomas Wolf. So Thomas is the co-founder of Hugging Face and he has been leading the open source educational and research efforts at Hugging Face. So he led the team which created the famous Transformers library and then was part of the Bloom large multilingual language model as well. He's in the middle of a lot of action happening these days, and thank, uh, it's great to have him on the podcast. Thanks, Thomas, for taking time out of your schedule and looking forward to the discussion. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Kunal. Happy to be here. Great. So, Thomas, uh, uh, you know, in terms of your background, right, you had a PhD in physics and then a degree in law. And then finally, you are right now working in AI field and, and you know, building probably the most exciting company out there. So can you tell me a bit more about the journey, how it happened, and then, you know, what were some of the key milestones in the journey? Yeah, a good question, right? It does not make a lot of sense, my background, but uh, <laughs> I guess it's the story of uh, someone uh, trying to... Uh, you know, being interested in many things and trying to find uh, what is actually the maybe the, the place where it makes most sense to uh, to be. So I really uh, I really like studying. And, and uh, in France, we we also had this idea uh, that physics and math were the the most serious uh, maybe career path. So uh, so I decided to first go to physics, uh, and then I. Um, discovered that actually physics was going very slowly when you wanted to do one experiment it was a several years of of work and sometimes it's even <laughs> 10 years or more right if you work on a large hadron collider or if you send something to mars <laughs> you have to wait 15 15 years or 20 years to get an experiment out and that was just too slow for me and then was this theoretical physics or this was still application oriented so was it applied physics yeah i did i did a couple of things and which is what is interesting is that they, they are now giving some results so i first worked on, on fusion uh nuclear okay. fusion with laser wow. and i don't know if you've been following the field but it, it starts now to give some results like uh, correct uh, but that was last year right and i was working on that in 2004 mm -hmm. so that was uh, yeah. almost 20 years ago. Two decades, yeah. And there is still, I went uh, and went this summer to see a friend from like uh, 20 years who was working on this first uh, fusion reaction that worked uh, to, wow. like, recently. And I was like, okay, well, I'm very cool and super happy <laughs> for you that it's finally working, but it was very long. And then, and then I worked for some time in, uh, in quantum computing, the qubit. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it was also at that time very interesting, but yeah it's i mean right now we see maybe the beginning of quantum computing but it's still really really early right it's still not okay. something really widely deployed and and this was during my phd so that that was 15, 15 years ago uh, mm -hmm. well, that's so very cold when you see this this cryostat that, that go very in the helium very low temperature i was working on these type of things okay. yeah and so basically what happened is at the end of my PhD, I decided I, I was not ready to, to spend so much time in, uh, on each experiment. So I was looking for something else. And I thought I was super happy to write my PhD actually and to explain all the things I've learned. And I was like, okay, maybe I should write more. And mm -hmm. so one field that I've never really had the time to study, but I was very interested in was actually low. So I decided to 
maybe go to do some uh, law degree. And so um, I went to the, uh, to become a patent attorney actually for, uh, mm -hmm. for five years, a bit more than five years. That was really nice as well. A lot of writing, a very different mm -hmm. type of work than research. <laughs> You, you, you build by the hours. I learned the value of time when you spend like 10, 10 hours. <laughs> and then you spend the, the, the price to the, the client and he's like, wow, that's super expensive. And like, yeah, well, that, that was very complex. So yeah. uh, I, learned, uh, I learned a lot of things about, uh, about uh, law itself, but also how to, how to be more efficient somehow in how, uh, in how I should uh, tackle problems and maybe the most important i would say is that uh, i started to discover startups and and like i had i was writing uh, basically all the intellectual property strategy for several mm -hmm. startups some of them that i still actually work with now and from another <laughs> angle which is funny to to meet the people again uh, and so some of them were doing early deep learning in 2013 mm -hmm. it was starting yeah. to work the mostly the image net moment you know like the first mm -hmm. yeah. uh, success and so they were using that for very smart thing automation um in uh, in factories for instance to detect like defaults or like stuff like that so i was writing mm -hmm. about that. that's basically where i discovered machine learning i was like oh that's funny Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a lot about physics when you when you look at you know the Equation of deep learning. Well, uh, we do a lot yeah. of training and hacking. But there is also yeah. something behind this, and it, it's uh, for most of them, it's very close to physics equations. So like, oh. And that's where I decided maybe I wanted to to study that uh, a bit more. And basically, that's that was the time that uh, Julien and Clément, my my friends, were were also starting Hugging Face. We decided that. Uh, maybe uh, you know AI could, could make uh, uh, an AI companion at this time. That was the first wow. uh, creation of the face, and so uh, and so I was like, yeah, I could I could work a bit on the AI side, on the science side, and see what what could get out of this. And that was the basically the beginning of Hugging uh, Face. Uh, now almost uh, almost seven years ago. Wow. Yeah. And so the idea behind the initial, uh, you know. Uh, days of hugging face was to create an ai companion then was that the idea you were working yeah on? yeah quite different huh? a bit of a, of a funny tamagotchi speaking sending selfies uh, able to interact in a very uh, in a very playful exciting uh, engaging way so i guess mm -hmm. uh, today some of some startups some new ai startups are actually doing things that are that are rather close not exactly but similar like character ai you know uh, this like yeah. a little um, um, animals or whatever you want. Actually, you can you can design a, a character with whom you can later talk or, or replicate or a uh, replica. Or mm -hmm. there is a couple of them, and I, I guess we'll see more and more because today yeah. the models can actually do what <laughs> they could not do. Right? We were we were quite limited in, in terms of the the quality of the tech. Uh, yeah. But today, uh, if you take a nice, uh, nice pre-trained model, you have actually something that's very fun to interact with. Correct, that is true. So, when when did this uh, uh, pivot happen? Where you moved away from this companion idea to what probably Hugging Face looks today? And were there any other uh, ideas you explored in between uh, during this journey? Yeah, a lot, I guess. In the beginning, we were really uh, exploring many, many, many ideas, uh, mm -hmm. all of them a bit around, uh, okay, uh, two things, I would say, how, how can we make this engaging um, AI to, to mm -hmm. chat, to talk with? And also, how can we get, you know, a bit, a bit, a bit more uh, famous, a bit more known? How can we grow awareness around what we, what we do? And so, um, one of our ideas was to was to uh, to do some research to to do to publish some research papers and to also open source some research code, and so that's why we we did that a bit as a side side task I would say. All right, it was not our main product, but we thought okay, um, if if we manage to um, publish a nice paper to release a, a nice model, a nice code library. 
maybe it will also make it easier for us. We were really underdogs at the time and nobody knew about us. We were this very small yeah. startup among, among a lot of uh, other small startups. And so we were like, maybe it will make it easier to collaborate with good researchers to, uh, you know, to convince them to come help us work on the tech. Mm -hmm. and, and that's somehow what happened and, and it happened so, so much, uh, it, I would say the interest for, in particular, the first libraries that we open source was so much more um, widespread, so much bigger than we had thought mm -hmm. that when we, when we reached the, the level where we, we could have raised the series A, like raise the first like uh, round of mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. we, we really were wondering, okay, sh should we not just pivot, you know, on this, uh, which was kind of a side project of open source uh, code and model instead of, uh, instead of continuing to, to push the chatbot product. Mm -hmm. And so we tried to take this big bet and say, okay, uh, we see there are a lot of, a lot of interest. We see them people who really love the, the code that we're releasing. Um, it was also somehow something we really believed in. In the end, we were like, okay, open source is something we've always loved. For me, I would say as a, something that I found super frustrating in, in physics was that all the knowledge was really hard to, to access. So I don't know if you know about it, but in physics, yeah. you need to pay for publication. You have like yeah, large computers, nature, you need yeah. to pay dollars for your output. So there is this difficulty to access knowledge. And I think something very amazing in computer science is that knowledge is, well, I mean, it's maybe changing a bit, I would say, in the past year. But <laughs> long, long, yeah, like, I would, I would, hey. yeah, I would come to that. That was one of the things I uh, wanted to talk about later as yeah. well. But, uh, coming and to... So, uh, we're, okay, if we, if we can push this, you know, if we can push this openness, that's that's really cool. Uh, that that mm -hmm. will have an impact. Even, even, I would say, if the startup is not successful in the end because you know startups they're like 90 percent of failing right that's kind of the life mm -hmm. of startup. but even if if it's not successful we'll we have pushed something we'll have made an impact which in our mind was positive impact in terms of more access for everyone to knowledge to code to mobile to data set. and so that's a bit how we decided to to pivot we were like okay this is both something we really believe in we we, we liked and plus we see some traction and so, um, yeah, let's try it. Yeah, and just double clicking on that part where you say that you saw some traction. So any particular aha moments or wow moments that you remember where you you know didn't expect, for example, the library to kind of become so popular and it did. And and where where was the Transformers library? So was that uh, uh, when this happened, or you could see that before the Transformers library? As well. Yeah, I think there were there were like really one year of of excitement. I think it started when um, so we had this pre pre Transformers um, library. Uh, we had actually mm -hmm. two. We had the first one, which was called DeepMoji, was a LSTM at the time, and yeah. that was a transfer learning model. And here it was quite maybe our first open source library. Um, but this was pretty bad, I would say, in quality of code. Uh, <laughs> I was still learning how to do open source. I came from a C++ background, so I was still learning Python. Um, mm. But then the, the, um, the GPT-1, that not a lot of people remember, but uh, that we mm. that we adapted in a, in a first model uh, called... Mm. Uh, mm, this one uh, led us to win a, a new ribs com uh, competition on oh, conversation wow. AI. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was maybe a first moment that I th that I was like at least uh, this technology, this pre-trained language model can work. And then mm -hmm. I would say that was the first like scientific moment. And then mm -hmm. the second one was when uh, when Google open sourced uh, the BERT model, which was yeah. uh, this first uh, model that I would say everyone wanted to use very quickly. And that was the first time there was one model that uh, became the center of attention of the whole AI world. And so mm -hmm. uh, this was like in the in in winter 2018, and I was at uh, the EMNLP, uh, the conference in Brussels. And I was like, oh, that's really cool, but this model is in is in Transformer, Transformer 1. Nobody's going gonna, gonna to be able to use <laughs> it, so it will be very painful. And at that time, there was the beginning of PyTorch. 
yeah. uh, 0.3, so also uh, quite uh, quite the beginning. But everyone thought it was very easy to use framework. So I was like, okay, let's uh, let's let's do a quick a quick run to convert Bert in PyTorch. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time that, uh, that like people got really crazy about one of the yeah. libraries. And so I thought, oh, wow, there is something here. So let's try to maintain this library. And then came the idea a few months later, maybe we should combine both. We have this GPT-1 code, we have this BERT code, maybe we could put them together in one library. And maybe we could even host the, the, the weights somewhere. We had this open S3, S3 bucket at this time. <laughs> Got it. So we just put there, and and that was the beginning of uh, the Transformers library. So at that time, there was PyTorch pre-trained Bert, right? And then PyTorch mm-hmm. pre-trained Transformers for a few months. And people were really happy about having these um, various models in the same interface, in the same API. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for a few months, uh, I, was, uh, I was mostly alone adding, adding a couple of models and then a uh, master a uh, student joined Lysander, who is now head of the whole uh, open source at, at Hugging Face. He has been growing like amazingly. Um, and yeah, in the summer after that, we've already uh, passed, I would say, 10,000 10, GitHub stars or something. So we thought this is something big, um, which today is not so big for an AI library because it feels <laughs> like it's so much more than 10,000 stars mm. is not small. But at that time, like AI was really below all the web yes. framework or something like that so yeah no i remember uh, tra- uh you know hugging face transformers library was one of the things which caught on slowly at least in the initial phase but but uh, there was a point where you know almost everyone i was talking to in the community was referring yeah. to it for for the nlp task so you could you could see the traction and the momentum in the community and it was uh, really fascinating to see uh, you know that uh, all of these uh, uh, difficulties getting solved in a very user friendly interface and then that kind of contributing to the growth so i think that was clearly a big shift and uh, so uh, so when you tasted this, you know, traction and then you saw this, so so how did this change your thinking about what Hugging Face should be and then how did it evolve from there? And then, you know, where does the Bloom uh, multilingual language model fit in? How did that start? Yeah. Um, well, I, th- I think one of the, maybe one of the, one of the luck we had is we, we started from this game idea, right? So basically we had, we didn't really have like investors who were pushing us to have like a, a business plan for the next month, right? They were all on board to build something for a very big community and then find a way, you know, to, to, to um, find a business model that will fit with that. And actually today we are cash flow positive, so it's really working well, but um, so we didn't really had so much of a difficulty to pivot in something that was still very community focused. There was still this idea yeah. of you know, making something that a lot of people uh, like to use, um, but that was somehow even even bigger because we were not building a product, but somehow we were building a enabler of product, and that's that's a lot how we think about Huggy Face today. Is we are not really here to build any specific product for end user, but we are here to build this platform that we hope is useful enough, is uh, is complete, is, is easy enough to use so that other people can build their own companies on top of it. You know, that's the idea of enabling the community to do things. So at first it was enabling them to do just research. So basically mm-hmm. giving access to BERT, very easy access to many transformers. So the researcher could do researcher research. And then quickly it became, you know, this idea of just giving access to AI for anyone to use it, to build things with it. And so everywhere we saw some pain points in access, we thought maybe here we can come to help. And Bloom was a bit that as well, because uh, after, you know, the Transformers library, I would say a second kind of fight we started to have, uh, at least some uh, challenge that we started to tackle was access to data. And that's mm-hmm. why we spent a year on building this data set and then the data access on the hub, which I think is still something like really, really useful, even if we talk less about data than model. In the end, uh, easy access to data is, is kind of a 
the biggest okay, day. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then uh, after this work on on, on data came uh, GPT three. This idea that uh, maybe nobody else could ever ever train GPT three. Well, today it's, uh, we know that it's actually very uh, very widespread and not so difficult. But there was this idea that maybe it's something that's too difficult for anyone but OpenAI to train. And I found this super frustrating because then people started self censoring them. They oh, we cannot. So like we need to do something. We need to show that it's possible to train model. Uh, it's also possible to train model in the open. You don't have to close the door of your company if you want to train a larger model. And so that's a bit how the, the Bloom and Big Science project came with this idea. We're going to find some compute uh, enough to train this size of model. And then we're going to make that open to everyone and to see how things train, if they want to give their opinion on how it should be trained, they could, and we want to have as much diversity as possible in the people who participate in this project. So we had also like ethicists, we have people from social science, we have people from like, you know, so there was a lot of things in big science around. It was one outcome, but there was a lot of like, there was maybe 20, 25 papers. That a lot of work on data, uh, on licensing, how it should be done, how it could be done. And that was quite cool to see all of that in uh, open. And basically, mm -hmm. well, I would say nothing bad happened, you know, it was just <laughs> this in open. Today, it's time we, we, I would say open source AI, you still need to fight for it. But I think at the end of 2023, beginning of 2024, it seems it seems much easier to think that open source AI is something there to, to stay and we can share knowledge about AI and that's actually a good thing for everyone. But at that time, there was a moment it was a bit critical. And so I think we had to fight for that. True, true. In fact, uh, you know, uh, from just a capital perspective to enable, uh, you know, AI for everyone, as you said, right? So, so uh, uh, I'm presuming at some point, uh, uh, the level of capital required to uh, enable this would, would have become very large. So, so I guess uh, uh, the question is, how do you did you manage, let's say, the investors and, and the business, and still kind of pursuing that vision to keep it open source and uh, at the same time enabling AI for everyone? Yeah, I think that's. Uh... I mean, at first sight, you know, that's that's a very big objection. You know, you can say it's cost a lot to train this model and then you give them for free. That just doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't have them. And how do you come <laughs> you money for, for money? But I think the more you, you look uh, carefully into it, the more you understand why there are actually a lot of open source uh, uh, companies building and releasing, you know, uh, LLM. And actually, you see more and more, right? In 2023, there were at least three or four new companies building open LLM. Well, I don't think there have been as much uh, companies study founded in 2023 and building closed source LLM. So I think the main reason is um, if you look at the long term trend, I mean, the first one is that compute cost is always decreasing. And that's something you can yeah. bet on, right? It's very uh, safe bet. And so the cost trained to like GPT-3, that huge, that, that looked huge, you know, uh, two years ago, is now like... Not big. as big. <laughs> it's like something you have like in your free, in your free startup grants from uh, uh, AWS, right? You can train a GPT-3 with that. So it's pretty sure that in two or three years, the cost to train GPT-4, that, that looks today crazy, or maybe GPT-5, it's not yet out, but will also look like, oh, yeah, but that's peanuts money. Every, everyone can do that. So that, that's, that, I would say, for uh, the ability of a lot of people to train this model. But there is still the thing that you're always one or two years behind. Yeah. Because you, you need to wait. But the other thing is, uh, if you want today to um, get people to notice you and to use your model, it's much easier to release a model in the open and have a lot of people, you know, being able to play I with it. Do. Yeah. That to you know do something yeah. very close and secretive where you say we have a great model but we won't share it too much and you have to apply to our closed source API and beta version. And today it's really hard to get people excited about that because there are so many people in the field already providing LLM that they're like, yeah, but why don't I use any of the other just 
closed source provider, right? There's OpenAI, there's Anthropic, there's Inflection, there's like, like a lot of these. So um, I think open sourcing a model today is a very smart marketing and public visibility bet, if it's a good model, right? But then people mm -hmm. quickly see how good it is because they can play with it. They can, they can. And you have this crazy, you know, uh, uh, ecosystem effect where people start fine-tuning your model and so it starts creating a whole like when you you see that exactly with the llama right it become a yeah. brand and there is like a lot all this fine-tuning of llama then people start optimizing their inference code for llama and you have all these things where you're actually creating a full ecosystem because people can very quickly test ideas and and and, and play with your model that that is much harder to get when you're when you're doing a closed source uh, AI company. So I think mm -hmm. you can unlock a lot of like uh, smart tricks to get you quickly to the top. And if you look at one AI, if you look at Mistral, if you look at DeepSeek, like all these like people, uh, all this recent team, many open source LLM, they're all directly unicorn company. They go really really quickly uh, to a high valuation because they get a lot of reach directly. So I think it's a part of today. Obviously, I'm slightly biased, so... Uh, <laughs> no, no, in fact, uh, to be honest, uh, if I look back, right, uh, not only my journey, but, but when I look at, you know, people who have built careers in this, honestly, I, I, I mean, I still struggle to see if open source libraries were not there, how could, uh, 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 you know, all of this would have become possible because, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's that's the way the domain has grown. So, so uh, honestly, yeah. to change that when when you have seen such a growth is is counterintuitive, and then it's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, it it feels that you're going against what has worked for you, which which usually uh, yeah. is not a great thing. But but yeah, that is that is how things stand today. Uh, so you know just. Uh, uh, again, uh, going a deeper on that, given that is how you know the ecosystem is evolving, uh, how do you see, let's say, next uh, 12, 24 months playing out? So do you see, for example, you know, even this year at Neurips Academy uh, uh, had higher presence compared to some of the, if I compare to, let's say, uh, industry research historically, right? So, so uh, any trends which you see in the way the domain would evolve because of this, uh, you know, uh, not as many LLMs being uh, open source compared to what it was a few years back in terms of leading libraries being very open source. Oh, I think we we'll see we we'll see actually more or more LLMs being open source this year than than closed LLM being released. That's, I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, from mm -hmm. what I see, and I, I'm pretty sure also some people who have stopped open sourcing, some big tech company will come back to open sourcing. So uh, there is a lot of trends that make I think open source a, a big thing in 2024. We have the new the new Lama series for sure coming. There will be like all of that will be much better than ChatGPT uh, open source this year. Mm -hmm. But I would say what is maybe a challenge and interesting this year would be uh, how do we see open sourcing of all the rest apart from the model? So like data, you know, it's, it seems that there is some challenge around data. There is some copyright uh, trial, uh, copyright um, issues, which prevents people from releasing their data set. Um, so there's a lot of question around this. I think we'll see mm -hmm. uh, we see much more work on data. Synthetic mm -hmm. data set is something I find super interesting um, because we can carefully craft this high quality data set. And I think that's uh, that's one learning at least from 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 us on Bloom was that one of the reason Bloom was was not so good as we as we hope as a model was that the data was not so so much uh, filtered we thought we could just put the whole internet in <laughs> and the reality is that the scaling law for the model are usually dependent on the data quality and so that's really okay. something we should have a lot of more uh, care for so i think 2024 will probably be the be the the year we we start to understand a lot more what what type of data is the best to feed uh, into <laughs> our, our evidence so that will be very interesting for the first time, we also have the, an architecture which is not a transformer, like Mamba, which is also scaling yeah. as well as transformers. So we might, for the first time, 
move a bit out from uh, from transformers. Uh, mm -hmm. It's still it's still I mean it's still quite similar in it's not like we're living deep learning and, and this type of thing, right? It's not like uh, yeah. like Bayesian Bayesian learning is back, uh, but uh, <laughs> we, we'll we'll carefully evolve, I would say. And then I guess we'll see some consolidation in terms of of products that uh, you know get uh, get really wide access. Um, mm -hmm. So that will be a very interesting year. I think I think it's a much more exciting year than than last year, where I would say when 2023 started, there was just only ChatGPT out there, which was fully closed. So there was this idea yeah. that yeah, OpenAI will do everything, and then the rest of the community will just stay on the side uh, watching what they do. I think it's much. It seems much less much less true in 2024. Though I'm sure OpenAI will release great model. Uh, GPT-5 will be uh, for sure very very impressive. But they, there is already so many things we can do with uh, all the other models, like the, the open one, that I think we we have not explored uh, all the application, all the smart way we can embed them somewhere because they're really small. So you can put them in laptop. You can even put them in a in your in your phone, that would be very interesting to have this local uh, yeah. LM running. So, yeah, it's, it's it's going to be a very very interesting year. <laughs> that is true. Model is also very interesting. Yeah, that is, and uh, you know, you you are obviously in the middle of a lot of this development and uh, actions. What are some of the most interesting projects you've seen based on these open source LLMs, which uh, you know are not the mainstream, let's say, applications. So I saw some uh, recent posts about some gaming applications, game development. So, so what are some of the ones which, which uh, you know, surprised you or excited you uh, in terms of new applications? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Huh? There, there is a lot, and I think uh, you know the the most uh, uh, obvious application, like the chat agent, is also mm -hmm. maybe not exciting anymore. Like. Uh, uh, but but like yeah, so I think AI in games is something huge. So we have a, we have several people working on that at Hugging Face, following uh, at trying to help the whole community mm -hmm. uh, integrating AI in in, a, in like a framework like Unity or like Godot or Unreal. I'm a huge uh, I'm a huge game creator as a, as a hobbyist as well. So I really like this idea of having you know. NPC that can uh, you know interact in a very interesting way or dynamically created world with you know a stable yeah. defense that generates your uh, the, the 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 new uh, place of open ended world in a real way <laughs> somehow is is very exciting. Um, the fact that also we can now not only do text but also image and sound you know uh, is also very interesting for games. Um, I think something I'm also very excited about is all this idea of AI for science. So AI for healthcare, AI for like uh, physics as a kind of a looping back to uh, my early career and AI for math or uh, all this aspect where AI could help us make new discoveries. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of mind blowing, you know, to think that we've built this, uh, these tools that are, yeah, able to, you know, unlock new discoveries. Um, so that's very, that's very, very exciting. I think it's starting, or it's just the beginning, I would say, of things, right? The alpha fold was maybe the first thing, uh, the first uh, tool that, that really unlocked something, that a whole field that was just very... I worked a little bit in, in, in a protein structure prediction, and that was like really, really painful and complex to do. And there was like a lot of limitation from things we just could not do and so here you can unlock a full a full a full field of of research so i think this this is maybe personally something that I, that i found most interesting because i think the mission there is is crazy as well um but then integrating ai in many other things is is very uh, is very exciting i think um basically we can have just tools that understand much better what we want mm -hmm. When you think about it, a lot of, you know, uh, the limitation of tech in the past 10 years were mostly this type of user experience, bad user experience that you want something and the tool don't really understand. So you have to click through many things or you have to select many. And, and then in the end, you're like, yeah, that's just a frustrating thing. 
and here we can uh, we can solve a lot of this a lot of this problem. That's that's the the good aspect, the very positive. In, in the negative, mm -hmm. I'm a bit worried that we might just become very lazy because everything. Will <laughs> be, uh, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's true. Yeah. That's true. That's true. And uh, if you have to put, let's say, a timeline on, uh, you know, when can we see similar uh, outputs in, let's say, video creation, right? So, so prompt-based video creation, which is which uh, is let's say at a similar level in at where text generation or image generation is today what would that timeline be according to you what what sort of time frame yeah um my feeling was the, would be that um we will probably improve a lot in 2024 in like 10 second to 15 second video duration right and then mm -hmm. if you want to go uh, further um it might be a bit trickier, like generating a movie that sounds still really daunting, daunting in terms of the co the coherence that you need, you know, over like one yeah. hour. Uh, but like for short video, okay, let's say in tw 10, 20 seconds, and we're maybe not so far from from this, I would say. But then it's maybe it's maybe better to count this in terms of uh, number of sequences of video when you switch number of sequences. Um, yeah, I would say for all the movies under like let's say one minute, it's 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 possible we make actually uh, the same progress in two thousand twenty four that we've done in image generation in the last year, which was mind blowing. Huh? Uh, yeah. Like we we went from this GAN like funny GAN, you know, we had it, uh, <laughs> one of the first success story on the hub was Dali Mini uh, with its kind Sorry. of. Uh, uh, meme, meme, meme type of uh, images <laughs> broken, yeah. and now we have this uh, cinematic, uh, perfect images that are, you know, even the hands or like the, the small problem that we saw are very, very close to being solved. I would not be surprised that we see the same uh, thing happening in 2024. Yeah, which is a bit of a question because we also have a uh, <laughs> And a lot of things where you know a deep fake video might, uh, yeah, might be uh, hard. Great. And let's say if you were you know starting a new open source project effort or library, what would you choose? What what would you feel most excited about if you were starting it today? Hmm. I would say. Uh, it really it really depends on uh, what you like i know for me personally what i like is to make mm -hmm. libraries that people find it easy to use and intuitive to use that's really what i found every time i'm, I'm actually we're releasing one so uh, at the end of, of the week or it should be today mm -hmm. but okay oh, wow. <laughs> okay uh, interesting about the 3d parallelism and, and like all this llm uh, training and the idea, what I like, is just to to play with an API to make it very polished, so that you you can easily use the the library. And so I would do I would do a library like this. I would I would select something you know that I think is a bit painful uh, right now to to do to to use as a as a software tool you know as a software developer, and I would try to um, to make this much easier to to use. Um, I think there is still a lot of things in AI to, to solve and to do where you can do that. Like this LLM, you know, all this question around guardrails, how do you handle LLM when they hallucinate or like, uh, how do you fine tune them? How do you integrate them in like integrating LLM in games for, because since you, you talk about that, that that's today still very difficult to do actually. You have to code yeah. a lot of things manually. You have to you know, make this Python thing interact with this C++ or C sharp thing. It's all full of like uh, pain points. So uh, that's definitely somewhere where you could like start from a, a clean table and say, okay, we'll put AI at the center or almost. We make this super fast. We have this GPU. We're going to use it at both from for the for the neural net and also for rendering. So there's still a lot of like cool stuff you could do there, but probably um, in a lot of in a lot of area as well. Yeah. Great. Great. And uh, uh, if I were to 
ask you what does let's say next few years entail for hugging face and your research efforts uh, and open source efforts at hugging face what would be some of the key things on your mind it's a, yeah uh, so predicting anything in ai over a few years is a... <laughs> yeah I, I know it's a tough one. <laughs> i think we try to uh, we try to move quite yeah, quite, quite fast and to stay quite fluid. We've, we've decided that we are here to help more than to, uh, more than to replace. So, um, yeah, as I told you today, I think there's a couple of things that we want to work on, on data. Uh, we want to help with a couple of tools. Um, on training, there's uh, a couple of important tools to, to, to build it that I hope people can use. Um, but I would say the fundamental of hugging face, I don't really see them changing a lot in the, in the future. There will still be this idea of, you know, building a place to, to share everything that's important for AI. So that's good. That, that was model, but data, there's the demo. Now it's also about uh, chatting, discussing on the model, your discussion page. Uh, and something we just started last week was also a post where we want, where we'd like people to share some good quality discussion like you had a lot on Twitter in the beginning. And I think it's a little bit harder now uh, because it's a bit noisier. And so good quality discussion around the new models, the new techniques. So um, I think the hub will, will stay and will still grow as this kind of place to, to chat with, which is very easy to integrate. Like it's just Git technology or it's, there is an API. And so it's very easy to, it doesn't feel so much as a closed place, but it feels like an open place where you can easily plug, plug your tools or your library into. Um, and for the research, we all keep just, yeah, trying to see where there is a, something that's painful. And actually, if you have opinion, if you have ideas about something you're like, this is something that you should do, uh, you, can, you can always tell me because um, we try to be very open to, uh, you know, people saying, hey, you, you could help here, that would be useful and try to do that kind of a civil servant of the community you know there's this stewardship uh, id behind hugging face i would say great and and uh, what does it take to build that culture internally so so how is it like working at hugging face and then how do you prioritize some of these uh, you know calls because at this stage you can you can go in hundreds of directions right how do you stay true to this uh, vision <laughs> about uh, serving the community and, and can you can you shed a bit of light on that yeah it's a good question because uh, i think when we started to move outside of pure nlp there was a common criticism of people who were like you should stay doing just one thing that you know you do well and, and it's very dangerous for a startup to do multiple things and to do a bit of text to image and also maybe a bit of audio. And I, st I think it's worked still well, but that's, um, that has a lot of um, influence on how Huggy Face is structured internally. And I, w I would not say Huggy Face is the best place to work for everyone. I would say first thing is because you work with the community, you have a lot of feedback all the time, which is uh, sometimes positive, but sometimes also negative. And so working in open source uh, means you need to be quite humble uh, and you need to be, oh, to be quite open to criticism, you know, to hearing people saying that's bullshit. And a lot of people have, uh, for instance, criticized the Transformers library and rightfully, and I still think it's definitely a library that by some aspect is uh, maybe very bad in terms of design, but that's the design we choose. And that's the one that uh, allowed to have more like a 200 architecture inside of it. Um, but you have libraries that are much differently structured. And so you need to be able yeah. to hear people saying, this is very badly designed and to say, yeah, that's, that's true. But somehow I, we decided to do that because we need to, to do that and that. And so you need to be quite humble. And that's, uh, that's something that's, um, that's, uh, yeah, that, not always everyone can 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 have or are happy to are happy to do. Um, you need to really believe in the mission. I would say that we have, um, you know, this idea of open source, open science is something that you know is maybe the most important thing to to push for today or to or to build. And you need to be willing also to recognize that the community is. Uh, 
in many cases, much smarter than you. So when you build a, something or when they build something, you should try to integrate with them and as much as possible, not compete with it, but try to see, okay, how can we actually help these other things? Like for us, helping PyTorch or right now, there's a lot of really cool framework being built like uh, Olama or like, I mean, there's, there's like thousands of them. Uh, and the idea is to just come and say, okay, uh, can I can help you. Um, instead of saying we are going to build a competitor, which is often when you think, is often the first idea that you have in a startup. You're like, we're gonna fight because you're driven. You're, you know, you want to <laughs> fight, want to build a company. And so this mix of uh, of having, wanting to build something, but also wanting to try to collaborate with as many people as possible and build something open, it sometimes uh, push you to. Yeah, it's it's quite difficult. You need to think a lot about some of the things you do, and you're like, yeah, actually, that's what I want to do, but it's probably not the best thing to do for for the community. It will be too much center around what I want to do and so this type of flexibility is something really hard to do uh, i think it's a lot about the culture mm -hmm. and that's something we try to we try to uh, detect also when we when we try to hire someone we have as everyone right we have this cultural call where we discuss a little bit what's the culture and we often try to understand if the person who's joining will be you know uh, willing to do that will be interested in actually helping basically a lot of people around uh, and being very humble um, and that's usually a good sign for for being happy at hugging face yeah great great thanks for uh, sharing that uh, what would be your uh, you know advice to people who are starting their career now and then what how should they think about uh, because again so much is happening at such a fast pace uh, it might feel either intimidating or, or it might feel confusing what to kind of pursue and how to navigate so so any pieces of advice that's a, yeah that's a good question i think i think this boys could uh, mindset like the mindset which is we, we might we might think you know that we are already reaching kind of peak or, or thing, but we're really still at the very, very beginning of AI. So decide you, you should think about everything in AI as an expanding, expanding pie or thing like that. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the right way to, to build something today in AI is, uh, is really this idea of, uh, sharing a lot about what you do with the idea that, uh, even if you don't capture then all the value from what you do, that's mm -hmm. fine because everything is expanding. The market is expanding, like the community is expanding. So just if you capture like one percent at the end of what you've been building, that's great. Actually, that's that's not a problem. So building something in a very open way where you share a lot with everyone about what you're building, or or, or maybe even contribute to what they are building at the same time, I think it's still a very smart way to um, to build something big in AI because of this expansion of stuff, right? If, if you're in a small yeah. fixed market or shrinking down, you want to hold on everything, but here you actually need to just be very uh, selfless in, in a way, like uh, giving uh, and you, you will see that I would say in the, in the end, that's, uh, I think that's very likely the, the winning, the winning approach. Yeah. Mm, Great. Uh, so, Thomas, towards the end of the show, we ask a few rapid fire questions with the with the guests, right? So, and then what I uh, would love to hear is whatever our first few thoughts which come to your mind on uh, okay. about those questions, <laughs> right? So, uh, so to start with, you know, I see a lot of books in the background. So, so what have been some of the books which have influenced you the most, and, and which one could if you? Uh, like to recommend? <laughs> I change, I change a lot. Uh, so, so this year I've been reading. Uh, well, this year it's just the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually have on my on my website. I have, a li I, have a li I have a list of books that you that you can go find. That's okay. the one I right. use to join AI. They, they're all great. Mm -hmm. uh, but not. But now I, I read more books about. Uh, I, I was reading the Culture Map. A book which is about you know when you have a companies with uh, many cultures and we do have that in at uh, face we have like uh, uh, 30 countries i think at the moment so it's it's really multicultural and and plus it's remote which uh, which also adds some uh, some complexities and so i'm thinking i'm i'm reading and thinking a lot about these things as well 
for the rest, I would say in AI, I've read the most of the classic books, so I don't read them anymore this year. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Interesting. And uh, uh, are you someone who, uh, you know, likes staying late at night and working or, or waking up early? So, uh, yeah, more, uh, more evening, evening worker. Unfortunately, that doesn't that doesn't go well together. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. And uh, uh, let's for a minute assume that you know the hugging face thing didn't happen, uh, and then you know that uh, moment of uh, when you were working in the law firm and then coming across this didn't happen. What do you think you would be doing, and what would you be exploring? A good question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's funny because I actually had uh, like uh, three three options when I when I decided to start Hugface. I wanted to move a bit because I thought after six years as patent attorney, I'm I'm now either becoming the boss and I and I make my own you know law firm, but I don't know if I want to do that. And so the the one one option was doing AI, so that's what I ended up doing. The other yeah. was a project that if you go on my GitHub personal, you will find, which was a, a toy for kids uh, with uh, called the Magic Sandbox. And making a company for that, they would build uh, uh, interact educational uh, toys for for kids. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. I still think this is quite cool. I might still make it uh, later, you know. When I, when yeah. I, when I, when I, <laughs> or adding AI in it because it's, uh, yeah. it's very the last option was uh, something for climate change because uh, I think it's still like a huge, huge challenge today. I don't really have time to invest, uh, you know, any energy in solving that because AI is, is increasing, still crazy. But uh, yeah, I feel definitely uh, someone who has kids. I feel like I, sh I should be doing something. So yeah. Wow, interesting. And uh, I mean, a uh, common thread which I see in the discussion is a lot of these ideas which you, uh, you know, have in mind are almost. 10 years, 15 years in, in future, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, how do you how do you cultivate that? Is there something which you do as a, as a ritual which kind of enables that? Or any, any specific thing you could share? Yeah, yeah I think it's a, it's a bit the thing about life, right? If, you, if there is one thing about life is you, you need to think about very long-term thing that you want to build and at the same time, you still need to do something day to day, right? You still need to prepare your coffee and do your like emails. And so <laughs> how you mix, it's a like very long term thing. You're like creating a family or I don't know, or you're like creating company. And also day to day, you just need to do one step by one step. I still find this difficult to, to manage, but I know that if I don't have a very long term goal, I feel like I'm a, I'm a bit lost. Yeah. I need this very long term thing to, uh, to be feeling like I'm moving forward in my life. Great, great. Thanks a lot, Thomas, for uh, you know sharing those really great conversations. So much to learn, so much to you know know from you. So thanks a lot for you know taking time out of your schedule and sharing these uh, things with us and with the community. Thanks for the question. Uh, <laughs> Thank you.